and welcome back to Donica and Shelby Read. I'm Donica. I'm Shelby. And today we are going to be doing a recent reads. So we have not been able to do one of these since July. Did you know that? We haven't no. Done since July. I did not know that. Shelby has been booked and busy. I say this every month. I got a new job. Hooray. <laughs> I've just been trying to get a handle on that job and trying to balance work and personal life because this is my first job. It's hard for me to know like what to leave at work and what to bring home. That's where I've been, but I watch all of Donica's videos. <laughs> and that's just how it's going to be. I mean, y'all know it. I know it. Shelby's really hard on herself, but I mean, I try to tell her. It's just the way of of reading. You know, some people go through slumps. It's completely normal. Yeah. I think what everyone really needs is just a book to push you out of that slump. Yeah. You know? Maybe Spooky October will help you. I'm very excited. Or and I was just telling Donica that when I go into a month, like, not even planning what I'm going to read, I'm very, like, indecisive. Yeah, so I tend to not even read. But we have our Spooktober planned, which that's going to be another video. Yeah. Spooktober or our TBR for October. Every video in October is gonna be spooky not very spooky but just you know themed in some Scares way yourself. spooky not that spooky <laughs> not too spooky y'all i am very weird about certain things <laughs> i am very weird well basically when it comes to books when i start them it's very hard for me to not finish them like even if i hate a book it's i will chug through it i just saw an entire thread about this i don't know if oh, it was really? in the book of the month group or if it was on like one of my other book groups but had this comment with like 30 thumbs up and it's like even if you don't like a book you have to finish it and people were like agreed superb I mean, and that, then uh, another person commented and also got a lot of likes and was like if life is short if you don't like exactly. a book don't finish it so, so true it's, people and, are and that's life. actually my left side of my brain and my right side <laughs> constantly worried i had only the second dnf of the year mm -hmm. and i'm gonna talk about it and it's gonna be surprising because i i'm it's just it's a it's complicated we're gonna go ahead and jump into that shelby will be talking about the couple that she managed to read and then we'll get to mine hello everybody as sonica said this is recent reads and this is my recent reads and i'm gonna leave it at that i didn't read that much but i do have a lot to say about what i did read so all of donica's time is gonna be filled with like all the books and the adventure she went on and i'm gonna talk about the same books for like 45 minutes no you better not <laughs> I won't. Guys, we have had this channel for like almost a year now, right? One of the very first videos we made was like our books that we want to read this year, like the books releasing this year. And before I even really had a reading taste, which I feel like I finally do, I just kind of like looked on lists to see what was interesting. And this was on my very first what I want to read list. It was Hidden Valley Road by Robert Kolker. This came out this year. Yeah, this came out this year. I don't even know where to begin. I'm gonna go ahead and just say this is five stars. In Hidden Valley Road, we follow this family. They're, I called them the Galvans the entire time. And it wasn't until I was like 300 pages in when I realized it's Galvin. They're the Galvin family. I don't know why I was making them Mexican in my head. <laughs> They're not the Galvans. They are a family with 12 children, all boys and two girls. And of the 12 children, six of them were diagnosed with schizophrenia. This family was an anomaly because there were so many children and so many cases of schizophrenia in one family that they ended up really helping out the science of schizophrenia and mental health. I remember seeing like some blurbs of it where like the family also held some dark secrets, but there really is some dark subject matter in this book. I mean, this is, this is a true story. This is a real family that impacted the medical community and this book spans from it spans from like the 1940s to present day so it spans the lifetime of this family i think it goes back even further than that because it goes into like the roots of the family before i even go into the story what robert Kolker did in this book is something that i feel like is almost impossible i do not know how he approached this book the research that he had to do medically the research that he had to do in terms of mental illness in the history of schizophrenia Digging into the depths of this family was just absolutely insane. I should probably just do an entire book talk on this because there's so much that I want to say and there's so much that I want to discuss with someone else who has read this book. So the chapters are split up, talking, kind of going deep into each of the 12 children's lives, but then also going into the parents, Mimi Galvan, <laughs> Mimi Galvin and Don Galvin. So we get to like follow each of their stories. The book starts out by kind of like, telling the story of this family but also the story of schizophrenia and where it where how it's viewed at that point in time so like back in the 1940s 
it's very loose people don't really understand it no one really knows what to do the more like inhumane ways of treating it are very popular and then as time goes on it gets more into medication but then that's almost inhumane too the way that they just kind of medicate without knowing what's going on and then it gets to present day where even in present day some things like electroshock therapy like they're still that's still a way that some people that's like their road to treatment robert colker writes this almost like a medical mystery it like presents a question and it presents tension and drama in this family and they're searching for answers about schizophrenia and Robert Colker literally answers those questions as the book goes on. You feel super involved in the history and like the outcome of schizophrenic like re or research regarding schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, any sort of mental health conditions. I would recommend this book for people who are interested in this mental health discussion, people who are interested in like the medical field, people who like mysteries, people who like family stories. I think this is a book that a lot of people would enjoy and the ending in particular i was not expecting and it was actually like a nice closure i cried at the end while i do think this is a book that would satisfy a variety of tastes and a lot of people would get a lot out of this i do want to say that there is some subject matter in this book that i think it could really turn people away from it if you find it hard to read about abuse of not only humans but of animals it's not extreme and i i don't recall the animal abuse being very descriptive but i do know that there is some elements of like animal cruelty also the abuse of humans and the young through adult through elderly humans in this book and like the abuse that they endure sexual and physical i think that it's important to note those just so that people know about that going in because of the nature of the story sometimes robert colker has to be sort of descriptive of what was happening at that time i think those are the two main things but i'd encourage you to look into it a little bit before you read if there are topics that you're sensitive to or that you kind of keep away from when you're reading my other book that i read this month was everything inside by i heard her say her name edwidge dandicott it's everything inside and it's a collection of short stories. This was a book that was recommended to read slowly and take time between each story and like treat it as its own little vessel, meditate on it, see how, what you got from it. I just read rave reviews about this just being like a case study of pain and humanity and I just, I think stuff like that is so interesting because I love reading someone else's dissection of human pain because then you can see it in a way that you didn't think of before. I actually read four stories of these. I read three and then I was actually like not really feeling the writing style, which is crazy because I felt like this would have been short stories that I would have really liked. So then I skipped to like the most popular one in the book that I read tons of people really enjoyed. So I'll talk about three and then I'll talk about the fourth that I really enjoyed. And I do think that at a later date when I don't have so many books on my TBR, I'm going to read the rest of the short stories. The short stories that I read were Dosa's In the Old Days, The Port-au-Prince Marriage Special, and Sunrise Sunset. All of the stories are related to like Haiti, Haitian life, Haitian life in the United States as well. So it revolves a lot around little Haiti in Florida. So Dosa's is a story about Elsie. Elsie is a live-in caretaker for an old man who I believe has kidney or liver failure. And while she's on the job one day, she gets a call from her ex-husband. Elsie's ex-husband moved back to Haiti, actually with her ex-best friend. Elsie gets a call on the job from her ex-husband and he's like, they kidnapped my wife or his girlfriend, whatever she is at the time. So Elsie is very stressed about this because even though it's her ex-husband and her ex-best friend, she really cares about her ex-best friend and is like, okay, well, do you know if she's still alive? And her ex-husband is like, I, I don't know. I really don't know. She was doing this and then she got taken. So Elsie is putting her job on the line essentially because the elderly man that she's taking care of, he's not doing well. So Elsie's so preoccupied with these phone calls from her ex-husband that she starts maybe being a little neglectful, not neglectful, but like a little less attentive to the elderly man's needs. And the elderly man's daughter kind of takes note of that and is like, Elsie, we really need you to be here right now. It gets to the point where the man is like, okay, Elsie, they're asking for money. Elsie worked so hard to earn, I think it was like $6,000. And she was saving that money and she worked so hard for it. But she knew like, if this is the only way that I can save my best friend, then I have to transfer it over. If anybody has read everything inside, I think 
this is the story where I felt the most palpable anger for another character. I felt so angry for Elsie because I felt like she just kept being the short stick. Although I didn't necessarily like the story that much, I realized that Eldridge Dundicott is really good at articulating pain really well and helping you to feel that pain. The next was called In the Old Days. And this is actually a story about a young woman who kind of believed that her dad didn't know that she existed for her entire life. Her mom and him were in the United States and then there was like political tension that lifted. There might have been a dictatorship that ended in Haiti, but a lot of people had a huge move back to Haiti because things were looking up. So her dad left back to Haiti, but the mom wanted to stay in the United States. As soon as the dad left, the mom realized she was pregnant. Well, she gets a call from her dad's wife and her dad's wife is like, your dad is dying. Can you come down to Miami? I know that you recently found out that he did know who you were the whole time and I know it's hard, but I think it's important that you come say bye to him or at least see who he was. And this story is really just going over just pain and the pain that you feel when you're saying bye to someone or you're seeing an end before there was really even a beginning. She's there watching, like looking at her dad and she tries saying like the words like Papa for the first time. And she's like, that's the first time I've ever said it and probably the last time I'm ever gonna say it. And she didn't even really know this man, but she knew that there's a part of him in her. That was pretty beautiful. The third story I read was called the Port-au-Prince marriage, Port-au-Prince, Port-au-Prince marriage special. This is a story about a couple. They run a hotel, I believe in Little Haiti in Florida. There are lots of tourists who come and this couple is very nice. They try to provide different jobs and money and medical care for people who can't support themselves in the area, I believe. They employ this girl who it's just her and her mom and they want to kind of give her a way to earn income. This girl has been feeling more sick recently and it turns out that she had been diagnosed with AIDS and she was dying of AIDS. It's believed that, you know, this was kind of the result of tourists who come and the men come and they're like these super rich men and they, they just want to come and take advantage of like the young Haitian girls who are working. They typically buy like very cheap rings from just the street vendors and they'll promise those young girls like, I'll marry you. So let's get together because I'll marry you in the end. But then these rich men go back to wherever they came from before they went on vacation and leave these girls. So they actually call those rings the Port-au-Prince marriage special because so many of those tourist men buy them. and give them to the girls and like promise they're gonna marry them. It's a very heartbreaking story as well. I, that's a common theme is heartbreak and how these characters deal with heartbreak and how resilient they are through the heartbreak. And then my last and the best story of the book that really made all of the others worth it because I got to kind of see Edwidge's writing style and just read a few more stories. The amazing uh, story that I read was, it's called Sunrise Sunset. We kind of get to see this story about two mothers one of them, she is a new mother and she is experiencing postpartum depression and we get to go really deep into her mind and see. Jean is experiencing postpartum depression and there's a really beautiful quote and I cried the most during this story because I guess motherhood and just family is very close to me. Just anything having to do with family I love reading about. I love crying about other people's families. So the, in this one, I cried quite a bit. Jean explains it. Motherhood is a kind of foggy bubble that she can't step out of long enough to wrap her arms around her child. It's not that she didn't love her baby. It's that she could not believe that that baby was her baby because it was so precious and so small and so delicate. And along with this, her mom, Carol, is suffering from dementia and she's spiraling very quickly into dementia and we get to read carol's thoughts in this story it is just heartbreaking seeing how she knows where she is one moment and then the next she doesn't both of these things reach a climax at one point in this story where there is real danger Ugh, i don't even know what to say about that story it is just so amazing and i think you can read it i kind of wanted to see what other people thought about sunrise sunset and I think I found it. I think someone published it in like the New Yorker or something. So I would recommend out of all of these, I would recommend Sunrise Sunset, especially if motherhood is something that you love reading about, family is near and dear to your heart, pain, loss. It made purchasing this book, it was already worth it. I'm happy I read the stories, but it made purchasing this book worth while I loved it. Also, we're filming this with one more week left in, no, like four days left in September. So I started reading The Night Swim, started reading this at the beach and it's set on a beach. So I saw that Donica is using her Instagram more again. So I took a picture of this book out on the beach and when I'm done reading it, I'll post my thoughts on Instagram. 
I just want to let y'all know. So far, I really like it. It's really, really cool. This girl, let's see if I can remember her name. Rachel? I think it is Rachel. She has a podcast and she is like a true crime podcast and you might like this actually i'll tell you when i'm done with it she's so good at what she does that cases will reopen after her podcast covers it sometimes she finds the truth and she gets lots of mail about cases that pop up around her so she's visiting this one town to cover a very highly publicized trial while she's at this town she gets like a strange letter from someone who's like you're my only hope there's something going on there's a case you need to cover but that's as far as i've gotten so i'll tell y'all on instagram <laughs> what i feel about this book but that's everything i read this month well and half of what i read this month but here's donica hey guys okay so it's time for my books now if you've been following our channel or you've watched any of our videos me and shelby could not have more different book taste i think she just said and i quote I love crying about other families' pain or something like that. I stay away from books like that. Shelby has such a, a high tolerance for that. In some of the book talks we've done, I've read some of the contemporary and I'll be sobbing and I'll tell her, this feels so good. Like I get why you like to read and feel because it makes you feel, which I feel in my books, but it's like a different it's not as hard hitting. I'm very, very outspoken about protecting your mental health. And just because there's a really popular book that everyone's reading, if it has something, some type of trigger warnings that really affect you, like for me, sexual assault, rape, things like that. I, it's just something it's, I can't, I, I, I can't, I try to stay away from that. So now we're gonna go into my books I read, which you will see are very different. You didn't even talk about this. We read this one together. Oh my gosh, why didn't you tell me? I don't know. So shall we forgot she read this? And I, I think said, I think in our book talk we did about this, she said she wanted to forget. So I'm sorry I reminded you. But we read Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. We have a whole book talk on this. I will go ahead and link it down below. We have varying opinions about it. I actually ended up giving it about 3.5. In Mexican Gothic, we are following our main character, Noemi. She is a strong, competent Mexican woman living in the 1940s Mexican era, I believe, or somewhere around then, but it's not present day. She's wealthy. Her father is in the textile business, I believe. One day, her father gets a letter from her cousin Catalina. Catalina was raised with Naomi. They were, or Noemi, when they were younger. So she's almost like a sister to Noemi. Not too long before this book begins, Catalina was whisked away by a white man to his manor, I believe somewhere in Mexico, but further than where they live. They get a letter from Catalina. She seems kind of out of it, scared. She's just asking for help. And it seems like the house, something with the house. So her his dad tells Noemi, hey, go travel to your cousin, make sure she's okay. If you do that, you have my blessings to go off to the college you wanna go to. So she goes because I mean, it's part of a deal, but she's also a little worried about her cousin. So when she gets there, it's this manor that's been in this family for a long time, this, this white family who moved, I think, from England. And she gets there and strange things begin happening. She becomes like very entangled in this house and the occurrences that are going on. And she finds herself to be in a situation where she's either gonna have to figure out what's going on and you know, save Catalina and save herself. Mexican Gothic, as the title sa says, it was my first dabble into a Gothic horror, Shelby's first dabble into Gothic horror. I thought the atmosphere was great. Read a couple of reviews, kind of weigh what people are saying so you can see if, if this is a fit for you. But overall, I think it's a fun read. Hey, October is coming along. If you want a nice little spooky, kind of spooky read, was it spooky? Actually, yeah, that'd be perfect for October. It, it, it had the vibes. It had the vibes. So the next book I read was Ephraim Divided by Ernesto Cisneros. I have a book talk on this because every month on the 15th, I am doing this new thing. I start, this is my first book I started with and it's mid-month middle grade. Wow, y'all, this was a five-star read. We are following our main character, Ephraim. He's a 12-year-old boy living in California, Southern California. Both of his parents are undocumented. His mother goes off to try to find a new job and she's picked up and deported back 
to Mexico. Basically in my book talk, I just talked about how this would be an amazing book to put in the hands of your child. I just highly recommend it. I have a 10 year old. I made him read it. Once he read, he was just like, mama, that was so good. If you want to know more, I will link my book talk down below. So the next book I read was called The Whisper Man by Alex North. And this was actually Alex North's first publication I want to say I actually read the shadows by him in July and it's so funny because I read the shadows and then I read home before dark by Riley Saker and I have another Riley Saker book but I think I read them in such a good order that I read the shadows first before the whisper man because I didn't know what genre Alex North wrote and his books are very like they have a little bit of paranormal or other. The Whisper Man is following the murder of little boys in this certain town and there's a detective named Amanda Beck and I want to say Amanda Beck is a recurring character because I believe she's in the shadows too. We start with this little boy who goes missing. It's following a pattern that is similar to this man named Frank Carter who was caught many years ago and he was a serial killer. He would abduct little boys and then murder them well he was put away so now that things are happening again the, these detectives especially this one detective pete willis who caught the original whisper man frank carter he's now having to team up with amanda beck and they gotta figure out who could be doing this is it someone that's like a fan of frank carter there's like this whole side plot going on of them trying to figure out before these little boys could be can be murdered or more can be abducted our second point of view this little boy named jake and he lives with his father who's also another point of view i can't remember his name i didn't write it down little jake starts hearing whispers which is why this man is called the whisper man because before he abducts the little boys he'll whisper to them like outside of their rooms at night there's always a little realm of paranormal in Alex Norris writings. I just love that. I love to be a little kind of just a little spooked. So if you want something that's creepy but not over the top, I feel like I kind of knew where this was going, this book, but it, it, they're still just so fun. It's almost like you don't want to just think ahead. You don't want to figure it out. You just want to see where Alex North takes you because it's just such a fun, easy read. So I gave that one four stars. The next book I read, y'all, this one took me way by surprise. This one reminded me a lot of The Shadows Between Us by Trisha Levenseller in the fact that that book I read on a whim earlier this year and it's literally the second best book I've read this year. Like I loved it so much and I, I wasn't expecting that from that book. And so reading this one, it's Serpent and Dove by Shelby Marin. This was actually the first YA book I had read, I checked, since May, since Hunger Games May, which I have already read Hunger Games, so I have not read YA for months. And this one, oh my gosh, it made me want to just dive right back into YA. Although I will say this does push it. Like this almost goes into adult content because the, some of the scenes get very steamy. So we're following our main characters, Lou and Reed. Now, another thing that's really interesting about this book, it's like 75% a love story. When you're reading it, it's about Lou is a witch and Reed is a hunter. Of witches he hates witches cannot stand them his mission is to kill them because there are really evil witches in the world and they are, have power that will just completely they they take pleasure in torturing and twisting and contouring people and just doing really wicked things to them and this is all set in like 1600 france but in an, almost like an alternate dimension because things are different obviously there's witches but they say french words and you know french slang and so that's kind of the scene that we're we're put into out of you know sheer luck i guess or bad luck lou is forced to marry reed lou is the most stubborn and petty character she is hilarious she has a song called, I think it's called Big Titty Liddy. <laughs> and she sings it through. And I think that song speaks for itself. Anyway, although that is completely just ridiculous to how they get together, how they're forced into marriage, it's completely ridiculous. But let's put that aside. The way that Shelby Marion writes 
these two who are so different and just to see these two kind of slowly fall into each other it's my ultimate favorite thing i love to read it i love to see it and then you get this random also world where there's witches lose running from a witch who is trying to kill her that's why she's with reed for protection there's just there's so much going on but it's like more of like a side dish because the main the main grit of the story is this love story between two people that are just destined to never love each other. <laughs> love it. That's my favorite type of thing to read about. So I get four stars. My next book is, oh my gosh y'all, five star. So good. So amazing. Neil Schusterman, this man can write in such a way. I read Scythe earlier this year. And this is the second book, Thunderhead. We're living in the future, probably a thousand or so years into the future. People have created something, I like to think of it kind of like the, the iCloud, like the Apple iCloud. Well, it's called the Thunderhead. It is a sentient, almost a being, like it can think and they have allowed it to control everything in the world. So much control that he was able to cure hunger, cure disease, cure basically everything, depression, cure pain. And he was able to even cure death. So nobody dies. Now, since nobody dies, there's a job and it's called being a scythe. Now, when you're a scythe, you are able to glean people, which is kill them. And that's really the only way you can die. When the scythe was created, they basically told the Thunderhead, uh, we won't mess with you you don't mess with us like we're gonna rule over ourselves you have no control no power and he agreed so unfortunately absolute power corrupts absolutely and also you know scythes are only human which is how everything got ruined at, in the first place before thunderhead came in and saved them this scythedom has now become corrupted slowly but surely although the thunderhead can kind of see what's going on he has absolutely zero he cannot do anything. This book, we're able to actually see, get more chapters from like the Thunderhead's perspective. There are multiple point of views in these books. I remember loving the first one. This book did even more for me than the first one. I mean, from the first page, Neil Schusterman is setting up this crazy plot that you just like you don't see coming. And then by the end of the book, your mouth's open because from the first page, he was writing this incredible and building this incredible plot that I feel like he writes in a way that is really on par. Like I feel like a lot of YA books don't write as intelligently as they can. Like you can use some big words, you can use some just, you know, help these young readers think. And so his writing is not too difficult, but he writes in such a just ingenious way. I just, it's five stars. I love him. So the next book I read was The Last Time I Lied. And this is my second Riley Sager book I have read. I read Home Before Dark first. And just like with the shadows, I'm really happy I read Home Before Dark first because there's like a little orb that keeps flying. I think it's dust, but I, I really hadn't seen what genre they were. So I was like, are they horror? Is this ghost? What's going on? And this being my second book, I kind of knew a little bit more of what I was getting into with Riley Sager. There's one thing that I will say about his twists. They are so crazy that I'm gonna, I'm gonna read every Riley Saker book. I have to, because his twists are so, you think you have it and he's like, no. And you think you have it and he's like, no. You just, up until the last page, he's twisting you. Like it's crazy. I gave this book three stars. One thing I learned after kind of looking at reviews on this book is that all of Riley Saker's books are based on different horror genres or movies like home before dark was the haunted house and the last time i lied is like a slasher at like a camp the last time i lied we're following our main character emma davis now when she was a young girl she her grandma passed away and her mom and dad got a big sum of money which they were right had money anyway but they got a big chunk so they were able to send her off to this like prestigious hoity-toity summer camp when she was there she was bunked with girls older than her and their names were Vivian, Allison, and Natalie. That summer, not very long after arriving, all three girls go missing. She was the last one that saw them and there are secrets hidden, things left unsaid that she still deals with to this day. Well now in present day, the camp director or the camp owner comes to her and says, look, 
it's been closed for 20 years. I'm gonna try to reopen it. Like this is my last wish. Will you go be an art teacher for the summer? Help yourself heal, maybe we can heal. And another reason Emma wanted to go to the camp was to try to figure out what happened to these three girls. One in particular, she really bonded with while just being at the camp for a couple weeks. And it was kind of this unresolved mystery that she never knew, like, where did they go? Did something happen? Did they run away? So she goes back to the camp to try to solve things when tragedy once again strikes and she's left having to solve even more. I liked it. I feel like it was a good read, a fun read, but to me it just was very slow at times. I feel like that's one of my problems I have with books. If I don't love it, it's usually because I feel like it was just some parts were just too slow. I do plan on reading him more because like I said, those twists just get me every time. The next book I read, because mind you, this was all in like September, the end of September, so I wanted to start getting spooky. The next book I read was called The Twisted Ones and this was by T. Kingfisher and I gave this one three stars. Woo! There was a creepy, 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 creepy scene. But other than that, it wasn't near as creepy as I thought it was gonna be. But in this book, we're following our main character, Melissa, AKA Mouse. Her grandmother passes away. And her grandmother was a wicked woman. She was really mean. Melissa really didn't have any connection with her. But when her grandmother passed away, her father really can't get around. He's like, please, your grandma was a hoarder. Can you please just see how bad it is? And if you can clear it out, Will you do that for me? If not, we can just bulldoze it, get out of the way and sell it. So she goes and realizes, yes, her grandma was a super hoarder, but let me just, I have nothing really going on right now. Let me see how much I can clean. So while she's cleaning, she finds a journal written by her step grandfather who passed away before her grandmother, many years before. And her grandfather's name was Frederick Cotgrave. In this journal, her grandfather is just speaking of the twisted ones and twisting himself and just kind of nonsensical words that really get to Melissa and as she's reading it she realizes he's talking about a book that her grandmother has hid from him and he's like I really need it she hid it somewhere I'm gonna try to write down as much as I remember about the book in this journal it draws her more into the house and she stays sticks around for longer than she probably normally would have because she's looking for this book now in this book she has a red bone coon hound named Bongo and this dog is so derpy and so adorable and Melissa is also so silly and like witty and it's a lot more lighthearted at parts than I thought it was going to be because the main character is kind of goofy. The story really has a lot of folklore. I'm not sure what kind of folklore, like who's for folklore, English folklore, I'm not sure. It's a lot more eccentric, I guess you could say for me. Like it wasn't spooky because it was, just to give you, if you want to Google this, after I was done reading, I read that this story was inspired by a story by Arthur Mocken Welsh called The White People and it was a short horror story. It apparently is renowned in whatever genre that is but if you want to look into The White People by Arthur Mocken Welsh you'll kind of get more of a better understanding of the folklore that inspired this book and kind of what you're getting into. Like I said it was three stars like right in the middle with me. It was it was okay. It wasn't something I would ever read again. The next book I read was my second book for mid-month middle grade and it was called The Strangers by Margaret Peterson Haddix. Now this one was really fun. I gave this one four stars. I do have a complete book talk on this. I will link that down below. I kind of said like when I was reading it, it kind of gave me like Dan Brown vibes or I was thinking it's kind of going to be like The Da Vinci Code, but it didn't have near as much as I would have wanted of the riddles or the puzzles. But it was still there and we do have really awesome main characters. It was a really good book and yeah, I suggest, I suggest it to ya. Okay, so the last book that I read before the one that I did not finish, I've been talking for seven years. <laughs> it was called The Spread, book one, The Hill. So I think this is just gonna be a duology. It's by Ian Rob White. No, Ian Rob Wright. And this was something I found on Kindle Unlimited. This one I gave three stars. The main characters I believe are from the UK somewhere and they're going to Scotland on a, what did they call it? They say it throughout the whole book. It was called a stag do, which I'm assuming is like a bachelorette party, but you know, in that slang. And we have Ryan, Aaron, Tom, Luby, Sean, and Brett. So we have 
Ryan and Arian, who are brothers and are kind of main characters. It's Ryan stag do. And so they all go off kind of into the middle of the woods. They have to trek out there. It's really hard to get to, to this cabin. And Ryan just really wants to get everyone together. You know, this is his really last hurrah before he gets married. It's like the middle of the night. They've all been drinking for a long time. There's like a, a vibration, almost like an earthquake. And they're like, what's going on? So they go outside, it's pitch black. And they're like, well, let's go up to the top of that hill. So maybe we can like overlook the area and see if we can see anything even though it's pitch black. So they get up to the top of the hill and there's this humongous corkscrew looking thing embedded into the hill covered with like this oil. So one of the crazy ones of the group, Sean, decides to climb on top of it. When he gets down, he realizes he has like all this oil on him and they're like, ew, let's go home, go get cleaned up, this is weird. Even into that night, Sean is not in a good way and they realize like, man, he's really sick. He's starting to grow some weird fungus on him and they're like, okay, what's going on? Does this have anything to do with the corkscrew that he was touching up on the hill? From there, just havoc ensues. This fungus has started spreading and they don't know how to stop it. They don't know what's going on. This almost acts like a zombie virus and turns these turns whatever it touches into monsters that just want to infect you. It was a really fun read. They're all really young. They're like 25. The UK or British lingo is really strong. Like there's a lot of lingo, which is, it was actually, I like reading stuff like that. Like it's really fun for me to read different words and stuff and try to figure out what the heck <laughs> they could be meaning. It wasn't amazing, but it was fun. And the second book comes out, I think in like a week. And I do intend on reading that one because they're only like 150, 200 pages. So I want to see what the heck, how does this end? The only thing that kind of really got me, I guess the one big thing was like some of the dialogue, especially between the main character and his brother or it was a little weird like it wasn't natural flowing dialogue i think a lot of it was like forced other than that it was pretty good my final book the one i did not finish i'm gonna try and make this short and sweet because i do plan on reading this when i have the time and by time i mean when all of my children are in school i'm not doing homeschooling i'm like i need hours hours of a day to dedicate to this book and that is house of leaves <laughs> by Mark C. Danwilski. Now, this is literally has a cult following. Search what's the scariest book you've ever read, what's a book you must read of horror. House of Leaves will pop up. Now, this book is, it is hefty. This book is not an easy book to explain. And if you read anyone's or see anybody's reviews, basically what you're gonna get is that this book is almost like Inception in a book form. This was written in the 90s, or, or late, late 90s, early 2000s. When I'm reading this, I kept wondering how do people read this without Google? Or how did they read this without being able to like reach out on the internet and talk to people? There's a lot of things happening in this book, which is one of the reasons why I could not finish it. It's easy for me to get sidetracked when I'm reading. So I have when I'm in it, I have to be in it. By sidetracked, I mean if, if I have to look away from the words to do something, like in this book, I, I really had to Google a lot of words. I thought I had a really good vocabulary, reading this book I realized it's it could be better because there was a lot of big words I'm like what the heck but like I feel like almost unnecessarily so you could still use a big word for what they were meaning but then they used an even bigger word if that makes sense like it was like almost like some of the language was unnecessarily large that it just took me out it's not it was not an easy read you're reading a book that was written by a blind man named Zampano. Now, this book was found by another person named Johnny Truant, who is a tattoo artist, or he's like an aspiring tattoo artist. Right now he kind of just works as like doing odds and ends around the shop. So he found this book written by a blind man. The book written by the blind man is covering a movie he watched called The Navidson Record. So now what we have is a book written by a blind man that is covering a movie called The Navidson Record that now was put together by a man named Johnny Truant. I love how at the very beginning of the book, you, I should have stopped here at the very first page, it says, this is not for you. Y'all, I, I started this, I think, September 13th. We're at the end of September. 
I only made it 75 pages. That was how hard it was for me to read this book. It would take me hours to read like 10 pages. It, it was really, really crazy. Like it was really crazy to me. Zampano's writing is in one font. Johnny's is in another. And Johnny's for a lot of the book is in footnotes. Now that's the problem I had is the footnotes. They would just take me out. And I have heard and, and read that there's a lot of ways you could read this. Just read the book, don't read the font notes or the footnotes, and you're basically just reading Zampano's work. Read it a second time, read the footnotes, or of course you can read the footnotes. And But with me, like I said, I'm a little odd. I have to read the footnotes. Like I have to read what's on the page. A lot of footnotes, which every time there was a footnote, it took me out. Then there'd be times where a, the, one of the footnotes, so mind you, let's say if this makes any sense, this is Zampano's work. Then there would be a footnote and you go down to the bottom and there's multiple pages where Johnny's just talking about something. So then you have to read what Johnny says, come back to where you were. It was a lot for me. That's all I'm gonna say is that it's it's so fun. I This book, I recommend if you have a lot of time, if you go onto their Facebook, there's a lot of groups. Hey, I'm just starting to read this for the first time. What's your advice? And they'll say, don't give up or don't start reading or don't stop even though it gets hard and like so many people I think have been where I am where you're like you either keep going or you have to stop because you realize it's too much of a task at the moment and that's where I find myself and the Navinson record I think is where the creepy factor is coming in which is basically this award-winning photojournalist and his wife and two children move into a house and they realize that the house is bigger on the inside than the outside. And they also start finding that a door will appear that leads somewhere that doesn't match. If you look out your window, there's a door right here. You go into it, there's a hallway. But if you look out your window, there's absolutely no way there could be a hallway there because there's nothing on the outside of your wall. Is there something living in this space? What's going on? I've seen a lot of people say it's the scariest book they've read. I don't think I got to a point where it was scary because it just was so hard. It, I think that that was the, is that why? Am I having a realization that this is the scariest book that they've read because they just absolutely were fearful of reading it? Because I'm, I'm terrified of picking that back up again. So after all that, this is why we do recent reads monthly. Well, you only have one book if we do the monthly. <laughs> hope y'all enjoyed this video. I hope that y'all will stay tuned to see what we're going to be reading in Spooktober. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. It helps us out. And I guess we'll see you in Spooktober. Be there or be a pumpkin. Okay, that's officially Spooktober. That's our new Spooktober slogan. Spooktober, <laughs> be there or be a pumpkin. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll talk to you next time. Bye. I'm just super excited for the fall being here. We're so excited. Hello, fall. <laughs> what? <laughs>